Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. One of the more exciting races and candidates has made room in their schedule to join us for today. And this is someone who's not only their candidacy, but their service to state government, I found truly inspiring. So please welcome back to All Things LGBTQ, Vermont's treasurer, Michael Pichak. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Keith. I really appreciate you welcoming me back to the program. So thanks for having <laughs> me. And, and maybe there'll be an appearance from Jetty at some point, but we'll, <laughs> we'll wait and see how that goes. Well, I'm looking at him right now. He's taking a pretty significant nap. So. <laughs> <laughs> like some of us would like to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's start out a little bit by just refreshing people's memories about your connection to Vermont and your connection in or involvement with Vermont politics. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I grew up in Brattleboro and um, that's where my parents still live and, you know, a place that I consider home, even though I, I've lived for the last decade in Winooski um, up here in Chittenden County and I'm very fond of Winooski, but you know, my parents, um, neither of them were in politics, but they both were really involved in their community. And I think their example of community service is what drew me to think about public service, um, both uh, in terms of my last job and the current job that I'm in, too. They were very involved. My dad was a small business owner. He um, was always involved in community activities like raising money to bring lights to the football field in Brattleboro so we could have Friday night football games and having that community engagement, um, bringing a teen center to Brattleboro that's, that turned into the Boys and Girls Club so kids had a safe place to hang out after school or on the weekends. And he helped expand the golf course in Brattleboro from, from nine holes to 18 holes. And on that one in particular, I remember asking him, I was probably a teenager, you know, 13 or 14, and he uh, didn't even play golf, but he had spent like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours on this project in a voluntary capacity. And I said, you know, why did you spend so much time on this? Took took time away from your family and, you know, from your um, job and, you know, social life or just downtime. And, you know, he said that Brattleboro had um, given him so much and had given our family so much that it was the least he could do to find ways to give back to the community. And that really stuck with me. And I think of that as sort of a guiding light for me in terms of how, you know, I wanted to live my life and what I wanted to do as a professional was try to find ways to give back to the Brattleboro and larger Vermont community that I feel like has been so good to me um, and to our family. And my mom, very similarly, she, uh, you know, founded a soup kitchen when she was right before she was pregnant with me 40 years ago. And um, she ran it until about six months ago. Uh, so over four decades. And I remember going with her when she delivered food in Brattleboro to people who were, um, you know, shut in and, you know, forgotten about in many ways from broader community. And she was just so um, always so patient and kind and uh, caring and generous with everybody that we encountered. And it spoke to me about this idea that everybody everybody matters, everybody has value. And that's the way we should be orienting ourselves as government, making sure we find ways where everybody can contribute and we're ensuring that everybody um, matters from the way that we're um, implementing policy and the issues that we're working on and caring about. So, you know, so th from their example is where I got interested in public service. My, my first foray into um, politics is probably, probably, it says probably 11 years old. And I went and I remember going down, like riding my bike down to the Democratic headquarters in uh, Brattleboro and, and doing signs for Howard Dean, I think it was probably, you know, and we're making handmade signs for something that was happening. And and then I'd always just been involved. I worked on some campaigns when I was pretty young, local state rep campaigns and Senate campaigns. I was uh, 
a page uh, to the legislature in um, when I was in middle school. And I remember that experience really well. And, you know, one of the things that ties back to, you know, public service now is I remember Bill Lippert being um, someone that was, you know, someone that stuck with me as a public servant at that time. He was the only openly gay member of the House, I think maybe the only openly gay legislator, period. And, um, you know, for me, seeing him in service, making a difference um, in leadership roles was, was really the first time I'd seen an openly gay person, um, you know, living their life authentically in politics and gave me um, that seed that maybe I too, you know, could also be in public service and wrestle with the fact that, um, you know, I also was a gay man. So Bill, that experience, even though it was really young at 13, and I, it's not like I got to know Bill well, I just sort of observed him, you know, it was really impactful. And so I went away to school and, you know, went to law school and uh, worked in New York City for a few years. But I always wanted to come back and knew I would come back to Vermont and and did so about a decade ago and got um, involved at the Department of Financial Regulation as a deputy commissioner, then a commissioner, and then two years ago uh, ran for state treasurer and really owe a lot to Beth Pierce, our former state treasurer, who um, took me out to dinner and said, you know, would you think about running? And I think you should. And, you know, I'm thinking about not running. And um, we, you know, I decided that I would do it. And she said she's behind me 100 percent. And we um, when I made my announcement, she was there with me and endorsed me. And that that was a big deal. And uh, and yeah, so that's sort of, you know, in various ways, even from a young age, I had an interest in public service and and why, you know, why I had that interest. And and uh, I'm glad that I'm in the position I'm in now because I feel like we're really able to make a difference and and blend those two, you know, blend those two um, perspectives that my parents have of the business owner who's, um, you know, chamber of commerce type person, my dad and my mom, who's more of the social justice person and, you know, blending those together in the treasurer's office where we're making sure we are doing all the things we need to do to make a good return on our money, make good investments, but also trying to think of programs that can help, um, you know, everyday Vermonters um, with their own financial empowerment. And, and I, People may have first seen you as you were the spokesperson for the administration during the COVID pandemic. And as I remember some of the polling, when people were asked who they who they trusted in state government, your name was always near the top of the list as somebody who was honest and who they felt they could rely upon. So there was a bit of a foundation when you decided to run for treasurer. And coming from financial regulation, there's there's that financial background and an understanding of the nuances of creating budgets, maintaining budgets, and also working with the legislature. Yeah. So what was it that, and you have made reference to, there are things that you've done with the office of treasurer that's beyond merely balancing the books. <laughs> so what was it you were hoping to accomplish? And how many of those have you already been able to achieve? Yeah, well, you, I didn't mention the pandemic. I guess I was trying to block it out of my memory, you know, so like a lot of us are. But you're right. That was a form you know, formative time for, for a lot of us. And for me in public service, it certainly was. And um, and uh it it allowed um, me to have a much broader view of the state government and the state's response, and a much better understanding of, you know, how the state operates and and how it operates in a crisis. So um, it was quite a informational um, experience from that side of the of the equation. It was also obviously very challenging for Vermonters and very challenging for all of us to try to figure out how to. Um, work our way through it and protect as many Vermonters as possible and keep the economy going and keep children in school. And, uh, you know, it was, there was no playbook for it. Um, and uh, we 
managed through it. And I think Vermonters really were the all-stars. They listened to us. They took into account all the information that we had. They understood that the information could change over time as we learned more about the virus. And, and then they protected each other. And that's sort of what Vermonters do. They look after each other. So I, I felt um, that we responded as a state better than any other state in the country and just made you proud to be from Vermont. But, you know, in terms of our office, I I had heard I, when I ran for office the first time, as we talked about last time, I, I think I was on the show, you know, we visited every town in Vermont, all 251 towns. And you have a lot of conversations when you visit every town in the state. And there are a lot of different people you're talking to and people from different geographies, people from different occupations. But the story was the same. People kept talking about housing and how housing was their biggest challenge that they were seeing in their community, whether it was a rural community, whether it was a community in Southern Vermont or near Chittenden County, or even up in the Northeast Kingdom, you know, that, that was the issue. And I was really interested in that. And sort of when we got into office, both sort of verified those experiences with data, trying to understand, you know, why do we have a housing problem? Um, what, you know, what is fueling that? And there's a number of reasons, but it was clear to me, we did have a housing crisis, a housing a sh critical shortage of housing. And then the other thing was we sort of did this analysis of like, what's the biggest, what's the root cause of some of the challenges we're facing? Like, what should we be focused on? And for me, it came down to housing again. Um, you could talk about workforce development, medical costs, property taxes, um, a whole host of issues. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, do we have enough housing to support our workforce and grow our economy? And for me, that's where we tried to make a difference. How can we use our office to make a difference on housing? And what we ended up doing was expanding this program that had been pretty sleepy in the years, you know, right before, during the pandemic and right before I took office, where we can invest up to 10% of the state's cash on hand into economic development. And what we did was we expanded that by about $100 million. We said we have a lot more cash on hand now than we did before the pandemic. We're going to take advantage of that, expand that program, and then we're going to dedicate it toward housing. We're going to really focus on investing in housing. And then the unique twist that we put on it was that we decided we we're going to have in low interest loans. So the loans were going to be below market so that it was going to help people push projects forward that otherwise wouldn't be able to go forward given the high interest rates we were experiencing following the pandemic. And we've been able to invest about $70 million of those funds. Uh, we have an announcement next week with the city of Rutland um, with a very, in my opinion, innovative partnership with a credit union, the city of Rutland and our office to build more housing in downtown Rutland. Uh, but overall, we have um, supported about 1,100 new units of housing across Vermont from this program. And and we still have about 30 or $40 million left to invest. So this is something we're really excited about because we expanded a program, we used it in a way that was creative. We did some innovative um, uh, approaches with how we invested the money. Uh, and then we had an impact and we had an impact on the biggest issue I think we're facing as a state. So, you know, that's one. And the other one I think about that we're excited about that um, also we were able to get done in our first term, which is hard to do, hard to get anything done in two years. But uh, this is one that we had to go through the legislative process. We didn't have the ability to handle it in our office. And that's this program called Vermont Saves. And Vermont Saves is a retirement program uh, that uh, will provide retirement access to the 88,000 Vermonters that don't currently have retirement benefits through their employers. So there are 88,000 or so Vermonters. They're generally lower wage earners, generally have lower education attainment levels, overrepresented female, overrepresented BIPOC. Um, they're the exact population. We want to make sure that we give them all the tools that we can to be successful. And one of those tools that's important is access to retirement, uh, because the data shows if you don't have access to retirement, you just don't save for retirement. And then you have a much more um, challenging retirement, less with less dignity, less independence. And we're trying to figure out a way we can do that and change that at a pretty low um, at a pretty low cost. And that's what Vermont Saves provides. So we the program will require businesses and nonprofits that don't offer a retirement program to sign up for Vermont Saves. Their employees will be automatically enrolled, and then there'll be a payroll deduction that will be invested um, either actively by the employee into the limited number of options that will be available to them, uh, just because you try to limit 
you know, you don't want the people to have this sort of paralysis because there's so many options for them. Um, but enough options that, you know, they have plenty of choice or they can let um, the default investment happen if if they're worried about, you know, how to invest and it will invest in a way that's consistent with what their expected retirement date is. But employees have the ability to control those accounts all along the way. They can opt out of the program. If they start saving money in the program, there's a Roth IRA that will be set up for them. They can pull the money out if they need it in an emergency, the principal that they've put in with no penalty uh, or tax implication. Uh, they can decide that they want to deduct more money from their paycheck or less money from their paycheck. So employees really control it completely, but the default is pushing people toward good financial decisions, being in the program, having a 5% payroll deduction, investing that money in longer term investments that will grow for when you're ready to retire. And that's a program that we passed the legislature unanimously, um, 150 votes in the House and 30 votes in the Senate, and then the governor signed it. And another bit of news on that is we partnered with the state of Colorado to help set it up. And um, because they're helping us, we're able to offer it at a lower cost and we're able to set it up more quickly. And then we just announced that this week we um, are wrapping up a pilot program where seven employers enrolled in Vermont Saves. Um, it's operational for them. And then we're going to open it up to all of those other employers by the end of the year. So within the first term, you know, we have introduced the legislation, passed it, um, operationalized it, and then actually got it running, um, which we're really proud of. I was going to say, and one of the other innovative programs that I have heard about, and it goes back to some of that root cause analysis of what creates an environment in which people don't thrive. You've started a trust fund for children who their families were on Medicaid at the time they were born. Yeah. So the, this baby bonds program, Keith, that we're really excited about the baby bonds program. And, you know, we implement, we proposed a full program last year and what passed was a pilot project. So we are in charge of designing the pilot and raising money from philanthropic resources. And uh, we have made some progress on that, but we're hopeful in the early part of 2025, we'll be able to hopefully launch the pilot. But the idea is that every child that's born into poverty, if you had a full program, would be given $3,200 set aside for them, invested in the by the treasurer, by the treasurer's office. Um, and then that baby bond would be available to them between the ages of 18 and 30, uh, to buy a house in Vermont, to start a business in Vermont, uh, roll it over into the retirement or use it on education, higher education or job training. So you're exactly right. The, the idea is that it would be breaking this generational link of poverty that exists when folks are born into, into poverty. It's really hard to get out of it, um, both because you don't have the resources and you know that that difference between you know having enough money so that you can have a down payment and buy a home versus paying rent, um, you know, that comes down to sort of those, those, that the base resource that, um, you know, some people are provided by their parents. Sometimes you're privileged to have a free education and you're able to earn the money in your early years to put that aside, or uh, you don't have other debts that you have to deal with. But for whatever reason, from an economic privilege standpoint, you know, there are a lot of people that are able to do those things relatively seamlessly but then there's a pretty significant portion of our population that just that just they can't and they don't have that opportunity it's not a failure on their part it's just simply the circumstances to which they are born so by helping them with a baby bond to be able to invest in their own future uh, we think that will have a dramatic uh, impact uh, on their quality of their life you know for the rest of uh, for you know for decades to come these are very innovative approaches to what the Office of Treasurer could be. So looking at your next term, <laughs> what are there projects that you're already envisioning or initiatives that you would like to see happen? Yeah, so we're we're thinking about housing, you know. So we still have more money to invest in the program that we've announced. Um, we're also thinking about, are, you know, can we expand it even further? 
um, and focus on senior housing because I think senior housing is going to be a key, you know, a key um, policy tool for us in the future. We have an we have an older state. We have a lot of Vermonters that are aging. They're aging in their homes with um, two or three or more bedrooms that are unused. So how can we provide a, a nice place for folks to um, age in place in their community, uh, but maybe in a smaller home that they're more comfortable in and it's more affordable to them. And at the same time, freeing up the home that they moved out of for a young family to move into. So I, I think that's one of the challenges. We don't have enough places for seniors to live um, when they're trying to exit their, um, you know, their, their home that they've been living in for many people for decades. So that's one thing that we're focused on. The other thing, you know, we're trying to find other opportunities to invest directly in people like we did, like the concept with baby bonds or even in some ways with the Vermont Saves program. And there's a big challenge out there with the amount of medical debt that Vermonters have. We're one of the highest per capita in the country in terms of the medical debt that that people, individuals carry. And, and that's a big deal because your, um, you know, the, your circumstances you know, you didn't decide to have medical debt. You didn't make a decision to um, buy it like you do when you buy a car, or you buy a house or go to school. Um, people are making those decisions to take on debt. But medical debt is not like that. It's something that's thrust upon you based on circumstances. And, um, you know, it goes beyond just your, you know, having to repay the debt. You have the potential for a lower credit score, that has a potential for higher rates when you're trying to buy a car uh, or trying to buy a house, higher credit card rate. So there are some states out there that have been um, able to do some pretty innovative things with um, eliminating uh, debt and then also separately eliminating it from being reported on your credit score. And both of those things are are something we're looking at and actively developing policies on that we hope to um, be able to uh, you know propose in a second term. So with our remaining very limited time, <laughs> you you have been a very open candidate. What has that been like? Have you encountered any challenges going out and campaigning or serving, serving as an openly gay man? Well, you know, I feel fortunate um, and I always tie it back to leaders like yourself and Bill Lippert and um, those that were just from a, a generation earlier that fought so hard for rights for the LGBTQ plus community. Those are not just civil union and marriage equality, but protections in the workplace and protections around health care coverage and, and the like. So I think, you know, through all of that really hard advocacy and really hard work, folks like yourself have made it so much easier for me to serve. And I hope to, you know, the very least that I could do is try to make it a little bit easier for folks that follow me to be able to serve as well. So I feel um, both a tremendous amount of, of gratitude and pride and respect for everything that you and others have done before, and then an immense amount of responsibility too, because you have to make it better for those of you who follow. So I felt very fortunate that I have not um, encountered a lot of negativity. I can't even, it's hard for me to even remember a specific incident that, um, you know, that, and, and I've had other friends that have had challenges living out and open in Vermont. I just, I just haven't, had to I just haven't had to experience that. So I know others do in Vermont and and we have a lot of work to still do, but I think we've come a long way. And I made a, you know, I made a really um conscious decision to be very public um, you know, with my sexuality, partly because I, you know, when I wasn't elected, I I didn't necessarily it wasn't I didn't always make an effort to do that. But when you're a public official, you know, I think transparency is really important. I think authenticity is really important. My husband, Will, we got married this summer, just six weeks ago. You know, when you have someone that's a part of your life that's really important, then you want um, to share that with the public as well. So it, it was, um, for a number of reasons, a very intentional decision. And I've been really, felt really um, just, again, 
tremendous gratitude by the response we've received from Vermonters. And and with that, thank you so much for your kind words. Thank you for your service to Vermont. And I look forward to continuing to interview you for years to come, <laughs> such as maybe when you become governor. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Josie Levitt, a friend of the show, who is running for Vermont State Representative Grand Isle Chittenden, and you currently occupy that seat. You yes, I do. Very handily last time. Congratulations. Oh, no, that's that's I did not win handily. I won by nine in a recount. Really? You yes. Know, I was looking at another race that was equally close. So get out and vote. Yes. The, and, and, and if you've ever doubted every vote matters, it so does, because I was ahead by 10. I lost one. And um, it also shows how safe our elections are, because... All of our town clerks out here did a wonderful job. And there was just one where they couldn't quite tell if they had written in or something. And someone counted it. And then five different people looked at at this one ballot and said, no, that actually doesn't look not legitimate. But it, it looks like the intent was different. And I have no argument with that. But I was very impressed with how well the elections are run by our town clerks. That is very encouraging, isn't it? Yes. Well, um, this is your third appearance on the show. But uh, let me third. Uh, wow. I know. First, happy first, to be <laughs> back a third time. Third time's the charm. <laughs> it's delightful. I love every interview. Oh, um, thank you. Well, let me let me tell the audience in case they don't know, you came to Vermont in 1996, uh, where you started the Flying Pig Bookstore in Shelburne. Yes. You're currently vice chair of the Grand Isle Select Board and a board member of the Champagne Champlain Island's food shelf. Yes, although I need to actually say I'm no longer vice chair. There was a oh. little bit of a coup. Um, oh my, but you're yes. still on the solar. Oh yeah, I'm still on, but I'm no longer vice chair. Okay. You have an MA in the teaching of English from Columbia. Yes, when I do. When not working in the legislature, you can be seen throughout the state performing stand-up comedy and storytelling. You live in Grand Isle with your partner and their rescue dog, Allie. Allie's still around? Yeah, Allie's actually right behind uh, right behind me. Yes. Oh. I, I'm not going to pick up the thing and show you. But yeah, she's. if you hear barking, that's her. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sparky, our cat, is on the coffee table behind me. But you, we have this strange background that just developed. I know. I like that. I, I My thing doesn't blur well. So uh, anyway, you are a member of the House of Representatives. Um, from 2023 to the present, and you're running again. Yes, yes. And one reason that we're able to have this conversation that will be the focus. Tell me if you wouldn't mind. Uh, you say on your website that you're running again because your work isn't finished. Would you mind talking a little about that? You know, part of the reason the work isn't finished is the property taxes. You know, I, I live in a district where one town, South Heroes, their property taxes went up 25%. My work isn't finished because we need to right that wrong. And we need to work together as a legislative body, not just Democrats, Republicans. We need to actually work together and put our differences aside and say, how do we help our people? Because I talked to, I don't even know how many people yesterday and one woman, I think, summed it up really well. She said, it is soul crushing to live in Vermont right now. And when I hear that from a constituent who's a fifth generation Vermonter, and every other member her, of her family has moved but her, and other people are taking out loans to pay their property taxes, we need to fix this. And we need to fix it this session. We can't wait two years for the, the educational, what is it, the Commission on Public Education to give us its study, which is going to be due in 18 months. We need to do something now. And I have one little bill in the works that we're, we're drafting it now that will allow more people to qualify for property relief, property tax relief, because it will exclude some categories of folks um, whose incomes will no longer count towards the household threshold, like disability insurance. You know, I had a constituent who's um, two disabled kids, adult children, moved back in for a variety of reasons, and their disability insurance was being counted towards the household income, and it put them over the threshold, and they needed 
all of that money that they got before the kids move back in to pay for their property taxes because they they have they own their house outright but they can't afford the property taxes and now because the kids have moved in they didn't get any income sensitivity so mm. they're taking out a loan and that's just you shouldn't have to take out a loan to pay your property taxes and we need to fix this what is proposition 5 and where do you stand on it okay prop 5 it's what it's prop 5 happened actually 2 years ago and it was the um, Reproductive Liberty Bodily Autonomy Bill. And it was what we voted on in 2022 that we, and that because we changed our constitution to enshrine these rights in our constitution. And uh, the shorthand for me on that is called Prop 5. And Prop 5, obviously I'm in favor of it. I, I voted for it as a citizen. I wasn't in the state house then, but both of my opponents voted against it. And oh. that, in 2022, Mitzi Johnson kind of lobbied me a little bit to to run for office because there were no Democrats on the ballot and for the primary. So I did a write in campaign. But the reason I, I wasn't I would I didn't want to do this. But the reason I did is because both of those men, both Leland and Michael Morgan, voted against enshrining in our Constitution a woman's right to choose and reproductive freedom to choose whatever kind of contraceptive works for you and they voted against that so i was like i can't i can't live in a district with people who voted against that so that's what prop five means that's really appalling and they're your yeah. opponents now two of them they are they're the same two guys they're like bad pennies they keep coming back <laughs> and what else differentiates you from them from oh your so much um they are and i'm not saying this in a bad way but they are both um, career military and that gives them a very different, unique perspective. And I'm grateful that they served, but also um, there's not as much flexibility. They're very, and Leland I've never served with. I've only served with Michael because um, Leland ran for Senate and lost um, and now he's back. Um, and they're just really kind of right-wing Republicans. And I clearly their vote on Prop 5 shows that and also both of them they are one of six republicans they are two of six republicans who won't say how they voted on the um january 6th resolution to condemn the insurrection and they will not say because it was all done by um it wasn't done by a roll call it was done by a voice vote but mm -hmm. seven days did an article about it and they were the among the only six who wouldn't say how they voted and that really bothers me oh yeah um and just own your vote. That's just, just that simple. And, and if you're ashamed of your vote, well, that should tell you maybe you shouldn't have taken it. Um, and they're just very different. And their idea of doing things is just to say no to everything. No to new taxes. No to, um, although Michael did say yes to universal school meals, which was the only time he voted with me. Um, and they think, you know, no new taxes, no new fees. We're just not going to do anything. And they forget that, you know, taxes fund a lot of really good things like safe roads, um, snow plows. I'm drawing a blank on all, and they just, you know, they pay for our schools. They, then they, you did saying no is easy, but coming up with a real solution is harder and they stop at no and don't come up with solutions. So, and I don't think they truly represent this district because when, and we'll take the proposition five vote, they voted against it. 500 people took out a two-page spread in our local paper pleading with them to vote yes. They voted no. And then when that vote came down for the entire state, 77% of Vermonters voted for it. So these two guys are clearly out of step with what Vermonters actually want. So that was that's how we're different. And I was looking at... Uh various responses to the current adversarial relationship between the executive and the legislative bodies here in Vermont. And it seems like they're just towing the party line. They are towing the party line. And I will counter, they probably would say I'm towing the party line. But the, the issue, here's where the frustration, frustration for me starts. We all have committees and our committees are usually 11 to 13 people made up of Democrats, Republicans, and independents. We work, I worked great. I was on the ad committee. We worked really well together 
And, you know, there were a couple of Republicans on the committee and one Republican, especially Rodney Graham, who subsequently he's, he's retiring now. Um, he was amazing. He was kind to me. He's a dairy farmer. He really explained farming to me because I came from a food insecurity background, which is part of that committee, but I didn't know anything about dairy farming. Excuse me. And um, Rodney was kind and we we talked everything out in committee and we we didn't always agree, but we agreed to disagree politely. And then you put us all in the larger legislative body and all of a sudden everyone's just kind of hating each other. And I, I never quite understood that. And I don't understand why we lose the ability to work across the aisle in the state house when we can work across the table in committee room. And that really frustrates me. So if I get reelected, one thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to start talking to more Republicans and just because I think we demonize each other. And I think we need to stop doing that. Life is too short and there are too many Vermonters who are hurting and we can't keep stalling legislation because we can't get along. That's for, we're all adults. Let's figure this out. It's not it's not rocket science. And we need to put our sort of Democrat Republican hats, put them in a drawer and just say we are human beings. Folks in my county are hurting. How are folks in your county doing? And take it from there. And I believe one of your suggestions also is that you work together in the beginning when you're yes. putting the bills together so it doesn't come into this, doesn't become a standoff. And Yes. You know, well, and that's, that's the issue with the governor. Right. And a lot of people love Governor Scott. And, you know, he's a, he's a moderate Republican, which is great. But he has vetoed more in his time in office than all Vermont governors combined. Wow. And he gives us feedback with his veto pen. He doesn't give us feedback while we're drafting a bill. And I mm -hmm. would, and I just talked to someone in leadership today and I said, why can't we invite him to come to committees and just say, look, we're, we're inviting you. Or, you know, obviously he's not going to come, but a representative could and give us feedback on bills because I don't like overriding. I don't like governing by override. I don't like being governed by veto. It seems entirely counterproductive. When I've seen us work in committee on some pretty contentious ag ag agriculture bills and we reached consensus because we listened and we listened early and we took more testimony and we brought more people in and we're like, hey, we need another expert on neonicotinoids and um, this kind of pesticide and can we get someone in to talk to us? And we listen and we listen early and we take testimony for as long as it takes. And if the governor would come in and just say, this is why I don't like it. This is why I'm going to veto it. If we had a chance to say, can we work around that? Can we try to maybe find something that's a compromise that feels like no one's capitulating, but both sides are heard. And if he came to the table earlier, he wouldn't have to veto as much because the bills would be more to his liking and the bills mm -hmm. would be something we could get behind. And then we wouldn't have to have we wouldn't have to go back in June for an override session, which is not how I want to spend my time, <laughs> frankly. Speaking of that process, do you have any thoughts about the appointment of Interim Education Secretary Zoe Saunders? I, know I, I am really hoping someone in the Senate has already put in a bill that makes it illegal for him to do what he did. If, if the Senate does not confirm a nominee, that nominee should be dismissed out of hand that's then if they have, if we need to write a law for that clearly we do and that can only come from the senate because they do all the confirmations we do the investigations they do the confirming just like the house and the senate in the you know bigger in washington um and the fact that he turned around 30 seconds after her confirmation was roundly defeated and appointed her as interim was just such a slap in the face and i will say that felt like the turning point for a lot of us because we were willing to give him the benefit of the doubt on so much. And then he did that and we're like, wow, that's it. I mean, I got more email about, please make sure she doesn't get appointed than almost any other bill outside of affordable heat. And for the governor to do that and for, for, for laws to exist that allowed him to do that is, I mean, it's unimaginable to me and it's unimaginable to me that he would even do that. And now she, I mean, I emailed with her today because they're having a listening tour of Vermont. And I, I I got the schedule and I said, you know, Secretary Saunders, interim Secretary Saunders, um, I would love to see you guys come to Grand Isle. Why isn't Grand Isle on the list? 
And then she wrote back and said, why don't you tell me who I should talk to? I mean, and I felt like saying, you run the school system. You know what the schools are out here. So I like had to do legwork for her to tell him, tell her, go to the South Hero School. This is the sec this is the superintendent's number. This is you know, like, are you kidding me? Do your damn job. Um, so no, I, I don't think she's gonna be good for Vermont. Already how she's handling this listening tour is like, we never said we'd go to all 14 counties. Go to all 14 counties. Sure. When property taxes have gone up as much as they have and you're not going to all 14 counties, you are doing every Vermonter a disservice. So and, yeah, I don't like it. I And she's wrong for the job. Yes, yes, yes. And my understanding is the Supreme Court upheld Scott's action, but then no. two senators are appealing that, right? Superior Court upheld. The Superior Court said we're not going to take it on. They just today appealed it to the Supreme Court. Oh, okay. The Vermont Supreme Court. I think there, and I haven't read the whole decision or anything yet, or the brief, um, because um, they're basically saying what he did is illegal because the Senate did not confirm her. Um, and but the the Judge Mello, who wrote the decision, said, "Well, you know what? There's no law that says he can't do what he did." So I think they're pushing. I'm not sure they're going to get anywhere, but I mean, give them, you know, the college try for the good effort. Yes, but you're right. It's It might have been a turning point because I feel really hostile now about yeah. that. And, uh, and I was never a fan of Scott, but now I'm really irritated. A lot of people are not a fan of Scott right now because he's also playing, you know, Scott is setting the tone from the top of antagonism, misinformation. And, you know, I mean, I've had things that he's written about me and part as part of an ad saying these, these legislators voted to spend billions of dollars. No, we didn't. We voted for the Affordable Heat Act, which was a study. We didn't vote to spend billions of dollars. And if you don't understand how to read the law that was passed, then I feel I'm, I'm, I'm more nervous about the state of Vermont than I was before, because it clearly says this is not the law. This is a, this, this law was to uphold a two, two studies. That's it. And now we come back in 2025 and we, we talk about the study. There's no bill. There's nothing. We haven't pr approved the clean heat standard. We're talking about how to do it, but we haven't done it, but they're using scare tactics and it's all over Instagram and it was all over Facebook. And the, uh, one thing that I'm doing, the only way that I'm keeping myself sane is I have now, I'm barely on social media. And what I've done is I've blocked everyone who's negative. Everyone, you're just the Republican. I had to block the VT GOP, the Vermont Republican Party, because they were putting such garbage up about me. And they used my name, Josie Lev, it's bad for Vermont. She's the reason Vermont's un un unaffordable. And part of me is like, wow, thanks. I had no idea. <laughs> just me by myself was causing all this. You know, so it's just when when the messaging starts from the top. Kind of like Trump opening the door, you know, like I, you know, you remember the the Pride Center days when Trump was was campaigning and hate crimes spiked because mm -hmm. he it, when someone can get away with that kind of rhetoric, be it Trump or to a lesser degree Phil Scott, it normalizes this behavior and it normalizes lying, and it you know, yeah. So I, yeah, I got some feelings about it. It's like he's campaigning against the legislature. He's exactly campaigning against the legislature because what he wants to do is get rid of all the Democrats mm -hmm. and put in moderate or less moderate Republicans. And I have to say, I had one interesting phone call yesterday. This woman I called, you know, you never know what's going to happen. She's like, you know, I was on the fence about you. <laughs> and I said, okay. And she said, but I did what the governor said, which is, know their record before you vote. And she said, I looked up your record on your website and I agree with every single vote you took. So my husband and I voted for you. All right. And I was like, rock on. So that was great. Um, anyway, yeah. One thing that I really liked about your website is that you account for people who don't have computers. And you have a note that says, look, if you don't have a computer, although it's on your website, I must have seen it somewhere. No, well, no, it, it is on the website, but I've had three people reach out to me and say, my mom, my grandma, my uncle, they want your voting record. And I printed it out and I've mailed them all 26 pages 
And I'm like, here you go. Absolutely. And nobody does that, you know, because there are a lot of people, not only yeah. broadband, but, you know, people don't have computers. I mean, we and some people out here can't afford Internet and I'm not going to make them, you know, and on some of my mailers, I've even said because I sent out a mailer that says I stand by my record and I had a little QR code. And on the other side, there was a thing about, you know, how to vote. And then there was a little asterisk saying, if you don't have a computer, but you want my voting record. Please write to the address below and I'll get it to you or call me. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I like try to be really reasonable. Well, I think, you know, no one does that anymore. As I just said, it's it's so uh, important and sensitive of you to put that up there. Well, thank you. I try to include everybody. Um, let me ask you about your committee work. You serve on three committees, the House Committee on Agriculture, Food, Resiliency, and Forestry, the Canvassing Committee, and the Summer Government Accountability Committee. Would you mind okay. talking about your accomplishments on each of these committees? Sure. The Canvassing Committee is just, it's, uh, it's almost a pro forma thing. And that's not a real committee. I mean, it is, but it, we don't meet. We just count votes periodically. And the Summer Accountability Committee was last year. It was a, it was a, we only met for six weeks, but we wrote um, a final report that was basically how can we be, how can we hold the legislature more accountable for not being duplicative with laws and also making sure that we get the reports that we're supposed to get and we're not asking for the same report from five different committees. Um, and that has been drafted into a bill and then bill, it did not get off the wall, which is basically a way, our way of saying it didn't make it into the committee yet, um, but we're gonna bring it back next session and just try and hold everyone. It's just a way to hold us accountable and make sure we're getting the reports that we're getting and that we're not asking for things we already have, we just don't know how to find them, which might sound silly, but it's sometimes can be very hard to find a report. And then the ag committee is the one, that's the committee that I go to every day. And um, we've done amazing work. We passed the neonicotinoid ban, excuse me, which bans um, persistent um, pesticides. And um, we had a bill for young farmers who were new to farming and giving them some, some financial assistance. Um, I'm trying to think what else we did. Um, we've done a lot, but I can't think of anything. Oh, we did some, you know, and we have some other bills where we just sort of tighten up old language. So you can't sell, you can't, you can't sell an egg that's been candled because the old fashioned way of looking at, you know, so things like that, but also bigger things that just really help support farmers. And the biggest thing we did was universal school meals that Very came out of our committee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've heard actually from word of mouth that there's a lot of bureaucracy at the state house and that that kind of bogs things down occasionally Is um there can be i mean not in committee as much but it's once a bill leaves committee and then it gets to the sort of the the so what happens is uh, uh, someone will write a bill it the speaker will assign it to a committee and then the committee will either decide to take up that bill or not take up that bill if they take it up, then they get expert witnesses or the, and they get pro and con and they they try to get a really balanced view of the, the topics of the bill from a variety of experts and lay people and farmers and whomever. Um, and then we voted out of committee and then and then it, and then it gets mucked with. And then mm -hmm. it might bounce to another committee and they might completely change it. Then it comes back to us and we're really unhappy. And then we send it back to that committee. That doesn't happen that often, but it can, and it can, it can bog things down. Um, but generally, if we're really dedicated, we push things through. The hardest part, honestly, is dealing with the Senate because they can say, because every bill that the House gets has to then go to the Senate and the Senate can say, you know what? We're not even gonna take this bill up. They didn't take up a bill our right to repair bill that had unanimous support in the house. They did not take it up. Why? Because lobby lobbyists got to them. Mm. And the lobby, I'll tell you this, and we can go past five too. Um, we, the right to repair bill, we, a, a farmer gave testimony because the right, and he's like, look, I need to be able just to repair my tractor. I can't wait for the Kubota repair man to come to my area or I can't afford to have it trucked off site 
you know, and try, you know, and that's that expression, I'll make hay when the sun shines. I totally understand now because if, if you miss that window for haying, you that's gone. And the guy's like, look, I could fix this, but I can't bust out the codes. You know how your car has codes? Uh -huh. And he, we had a great interview with him. He gave us great testimony. And then he actually, he got off the line and then he texted us back and said, within 30 seconds of him getting off our committee page, our, our committee Zoom, he got reached out to by John Deere saying, we'll give you what you need. Wow. 30 seconds. And I am not kidding. 30 seconds. Unbelievable. So they are there, they are watching, and they are very powerful. And that's why this year, the only PAC money I'm taking is from queer, queer groups. I'm not taking mm -hmm. it from any energy groups, NEA, labor orgs. I, I want every vote I take, if I win, to be completely unfettered by PAC money donations. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I'm that's, trying. That's rare, too. Well, you know, I, it's I'm lucky. I'm in Lockwood that I'm I'm a good fundraiser, and I'm not in a financial hole. Mm -hmm. And I I was able to I front loaded and I raised a lot of money early. I raised like I had ten thousand dollars by March because I didn't want to be campaigning hard and not being able to do things because of financial constraints. Mm -hmm. So I tried. I thought about that and. Yeah, and I, I've I've raised as much as I'm comfortable spending, which works out great. <laughs> uh -huh. That's great. Yeah, I do have a question that we didn't yes. review before, and it's kind of broad. What's your sense of the electorate right now? I mean, we, all we it's so anxiety producing to uh, turn on the TV and listen to the news. You mean in 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 the national? In Vermont, I guess. Vermont, I think we're going to be okay. Um, I think we're going to lose some some Democratic seats, and I very well could be one of them. Oh, I hope not. I hope not either. But this is a really tough district. You know, I mean, Mitzi Johnson, who was the Speaker of the House, lost by twenty votes. I I won by nine. The margins are getting smaller and smaller. And Leland and Michael Morgan have a huge following in Milton, um, and Republicans really like them. Democrats don't, and a lot of people are disgusted by how they're campaigning, because it's so nasty. So. I think that's actually going to backfire on them. But I will say, excuse me, half the, not half, probably, no, I'm going to say half. Half the people I'm calling who I talk to, almost every call ends with, what do we do about Trump? <laughs> and that everyone is so anxious about that. And I'm like, well, first of all, you don't vote for him. <laughs> and, and second, I just hope Kamala wins by enough that no one can say, well, this was a squeaker or they're going to, you know, bog it down in court for years. I don't know. Everyone's on edge. It could go either way. I mean, everything is so close. My race is really close. The Trump-Harris race is really close. I will see. I mean, I really hope Kamala wins. Excuse me. There does seem to be a ground. I mean, she's raised a billion dollars in like six weeks or something absurd. Mm -hmm. A billion. But why are we spending a billion dollars on this campaign, on any campaign? Think of what we could do with a billion dollars in Vermont. My God, you know? And the money that we're spending on Vermont... I mean, I, I look at some of the Senate races, they're spending seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. And Phil Scott's throwing thousands of dollars at as many people as he can. And we're spending too much. And I I, I don't agree with that. No. Anyway, I've, I've gone off topic. But I hope, here's what I hope. Every Vermonter got mailed a ballot. I hope every Vermonter turns in their ballot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we will see what happens. I just want, and I think we're on track to do, have 80% voter turnout because we've had that much early voting. So that's astonishing. And go Vermont for that. Yes, yes. So speaking of your race, what can viewers do to support you? Um, you know, if, if they're Democrats, there's a, a thing called Mobilize. They could go to the Vermont Democratic Party main page and they'll find the Mobilize thing there. Um, I have a couple events coming up. Uh, I have an event that I think a lot of people would really enjoy, which is um, February, not February, my God, um, yeah. October 27th at Kramer and Kin, which is a really great microbrewery up in Alberg. It's at the Alberg and they're, they're housed in the Alberg Golf Links. And it's that Sunday, October 27th from four to six. And uh, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman will be there. Um, Senate candidate Andy Jula will be there. I'll be there. Luke Richter, who's running with me, will be there. And Howard Dean is a special guest. 
And uh, rumor has it there will be other special guests, but no one will say anything to me except there's going to be some special people coming. I'm like, <laughs> okay, but they won't tell me who. So, I mean, I have no idea. But um, I think that's going to be a great last chance for folks up in this district to say, okay, I've got some questions. I haven't mm -hmm. voted yet. How do you stand on this? And it's, uh, you know, the last one of these I did was just a great roundtable discussion. Mike Pichek was there and it was me and Mike and Andy Julo and probably just 10 people, but it was an, a, it was an amazing discussion. And that's, that kind of voter contact really matters. And also we'll have appetizers and um, Kramer and Ken is catering it, but also some of the Democrats themselves are bringing appetizers. And we clearly have some chefs in the mix because the appetizers are always amazing. Oh, um, and wow. the beer is great. So if you're in the neighborhood, um, I urge everyone to come up because I think it's going to be a really wonderful event. And that's the day after we air. So. Oh, perfect. Timing. Perfect. That's fabulous. Well, Josie, this has been fun as always. and very Thank you. I feel the same. And I have to encourage our viewers to vote for you and support you in any way they can. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. We need, uh, you know, every Democrat, we can't be, this is the year we cannot be complacent. No. You can't assume your neighbor is going to vote. Every single person has to vote. That's, that's the only way we're going to win this. Josie Levitt, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, remember, resist.